This is the story of a remarkable place that 27,000 children called home. At a time when children were expendable, the Foundling Hospital gave them the opportunity to not just survive, but to thrive as individuals. And of the children themselves and the fascinating lives some of them went on to live. Even though she's been through so much, Frances Coombe kind of gets her happy ending in the end. We'll uncover how the stories of the earliest children to experience residential care are being preserved for future generations with the help of the National Lottery Heritage Fund. One of the greatest things to happen for historians is this tremendous digitization project. It's not just about babies and children, there's so much more. And how the pioneering work of the Foundling Hospital, today known as Corum, the UK's first and oldest children's charity continues to support hundreds of thousands of children and young people every year. The driving thing at the heart of this organisation is and always has been the child first. Eighteenth-century London was a magnet. With its trade opportunities expanding, people were drawn to the city from all over the country. On arrival, they faced disease, danger and destitution. This volatile mix was brilliantly captured in Gin Lane by artist William Hogarth, one of the foundling hospital's governors and foster carers. What a lot of people don't realise about London, especially in the middle of the 18th century, was that it had a very young population. London was a centre of industry, a centre of commerce. People came to work in London. A lot of the people who came to London were young women, working class women, looking for work. Uneducated working class women had almost no prospects in life and they were stuck in a poverty trap. It was very, very difficult for women. I think life in the early 18th century was beyond hard. It was fragile, it was frightening, it was a daily fight for survival. There was no safety net, apart from the workhouse, which I think most of us would not describe as charity. There was nowhere to turn. The workhouse provided basic shelter in return for hard labour, including by children and a pittance in pay. For a woman who found herself pregnant, outside of marriage, or with no family who would support her, there was nowhere to go. Going into a workhouse was a mark of shame. It was the ultimate symbol of failure. You had nothing. And so this cycle of poverty was incredibly difficult to break. In the 1700s, London's population had grown to around 600,000, the largest city in the world. Of those, at least one in 10 lived in abject poverty, with women making up by far the largest numbers. There were children who lived on the streets. There was a lot of poverty. It was just what happened. Babies died, women gave birth in secret because they were terrified of the consequences of, of being found out and they abandoned their babies. People thought, well, it's a shame, but you know, what can you do? I think Thomas Coram was appalled at what he found, bodies of babies on the streets, when every life was clearly precious to the future of the nation. He said he would save the lives of your majesty's subjects and render them useful. Thomas Coram was an ordinary man who trained as a shipwright before travelling to America, where his progressive views on education and equality were not shared, and he returned to London in 1720. It was seeing the desperate plight of impoverished women and babies on the streets of London that spurred him to create the UK's first foundling hospital. At the time, he was radical. He was revolutionary in what he did, thinking about the welfare of children, giving a voice to the voiceless, 
and thinking about the circumstances that women, mothers, fathers, children found themselves in at the time. The times he lives in is a very rigid society. For him to get the Foundling Hospital built, he needs the support of the great and the good. He was not by any means a member of the aristocracy. He had very little education, so he couldn't write or speak probably in hugely articulate ways to persuade the powers that be. He cannot go directly to the rich and powerful men, but he can approach their wives. They're women who understand how precarious women's position is in society. They know what it's like to lose a child. As soon as you got one duchess, then she had sisters and daughters, and the ball started rolling. The name of Foundling Hospital was a stroke of genius. At this time, a hospital could mean any hostel or shelter for those in need. They're not foundlings. They're not found. The proper title at the time was for deserted and exposed children. Well, they weren't deserted because their mothers brought them there and they weren't exposed because they weren't picked up in the street. All of this idea around calling them foundlings, I suppose it's what we would now talk about as branding or marketing. You know, it means something to people. It took Thomas Coram 17 years of campaigning to receive the charity's Royal Charter in 1739 and the Foundling Hospital opened its doors to its first children in 1741. Starting from day one, it, one can only imagine the enormity of the task they had. They had to find a building and an, a, an architect, they had to plan an education system, they had to recruit staff, they had to get a system in place for receiving children, which was extraordinarily detailed. The governors took exceptional care to document their charges, and some of the details of their lives at the hospital. Billet books are one of the ways the lives of children were recorded. So we're in the conservation studio at the London Metropolitan Archives and they look after all of the Founding Hospital archives on behalf of Coram. I have been delving into the archives here at the LMA, looking at the billet forms, which were the earlier ways of recording the infants coming into the hospital. And in those, the secretary would note down the clothing that the child was wearing, the, the date that they were admitted, the time. Alongside the general registers of admission, the billet books and fastidious notes kept by the governors, Coram's archive includes petition letters from mothers asking the hospital to accept their child. So here we've got the petition letter for Mary Miller. Her petition was read before the governors on the 7th of November 1787. It tells a very typical story. She's fallen pregnant by a young man and he's now deserted her and she is unable to maintain herself and her child. Your petitioner is a very great object, having had the misfortune of having a child with a young man who has quitted her and child, leaving them in the most extreme misery and not knowing where he has gone to as she has no friend nor any way of maintaining herself nor child. And he actually becomes the foundling George King. Mary's son, George King, was initially apprenticed to a confectioner, but eventually found his way to the Navy. We know about George King's life because he is the only foundling of the 18th century that wrote his autobiography. And so we have this wonderful narrative of his life from leaving his nurse in Hemel Hempstead and returning to the hospital right the way through until he actually becomes a Chelsea pensioner at the Greenwich Hospital. In the meantime, he has all these amazing adventures. He runs away from his apprenticeship in London and is press ganged into the Royal Navy and finds himself on a ship at the Battle of Trafalgar. And actually, they ended up towing Nelson's ship a long way back to, to Britain after the battle is over. To discover more about the individual stories behind Coram's archive, young people who have experience of being in care visited the archive to read Mary's letter themselves. And we'll see what we'll find out. I think the thing that really does hurt the most about this one specifically is she was all alone. And from my opinion, the women who have this much courage to go, my child needs the best in life that life can possibly give and I cannot give that. Like they're some of the strongest people mentally. Yeah, that's why I said to I be salute able to her. Do that. Yeah. 
These are billet forms that in the early years of the hospital were filled out by the secretary when the baby arrived and it filled in the details of what the child was wearing um, as a way of kind of helping them identify a child at a later date and because they didn't take any details about the mothers they started leaving tokens with their children and these were objects like sometimes a coin, sometimes a bit of a ribbon that they'd embroidered and they were kind of tokens of love really for their children but also a way that if they returned they would be able to describe something that they'd left with their child and that would match with the child in the records and they'd be able to find them. Whilst it was possible for mothers to reclaim their children, this was very rare. Tokens were only used for the first two decades of the Foundling Hospital's existence, but they offer a key insight into the thoughts and feelings of the mothers who left them. For the governors, they were very much an official way of reclaiming the children. But of course, for the parents, it was never about that officialdom. I think there was quite a desire to express that idea that you weren't giving them up lightly, the hearts that are left, I think they're very much trying to say, you know, this isn't because I want to, it's because I have to. The Foundling Hospital was designed to give children and their mothers a fresh start. In practice, this meant admitting children from all circumstances with a guarantee of anonymity for mother and child. It's absolutely crucial in Thomas Coram's thinking that the mothers are given the opportunity for a fresh start in life. And that means giving them anonymity. It's also seen as important to give the child a fresh start, if you like, because at that time, the idea of bad blood, the idea that you know, your mother has fallen into wickedness and um, has lost her reputation, this will transfer into the child. And that's a very dominant theme that goes on right on into the 20th century. So for the children to be given a fresh start, it means a new name. For the mothers to be given a fresh start, it means anonymity. One case that illustrates this anonymity is that of Margaret Larney and her two sons. Margaret Larney was a woman from Ireland who moved to London with her partner Terence. They're a poor family, four children, they're both going out to work. In order to supplement their income, Margaret was involved in the filing of gold coins. The practice of filing coins was considered a gravely serious debasement of the currency of the realm. Those caught could be handed the harshest possible sentence. It sat under the broader charge of high treason, which was punishable by death. The death sentence was handed down to Margaret in 1758. Now the reason that she's not executed immediately or, or kind of within a few months after her sentence is handed down is because it was found that she was carrying a child at the time. Now during that time, the family completely fractures. Terence absconds um, and he takes the oldest. Now that leaves three children. One of them is John Larney and John Larney is admitted to the Foundling Hospital and his name is changed to George Millet. Throughout the time that Margaret is in prison, she seems to have known that, that John has entered the, the Foundling Hospital. And we know that she knows that because after Margaret gives birth to her youngest child, um, she writes to the governors of the Foundling Hospital asking for that child to be admitted and for the two children to be introduced to one another. Um, now there's a sort of tragedy in that because we know that children when they entered the hospital would essentially have their um, former identities stripped. So if, if the two had ever been in the building at the same time, they would never have known that they were siblings. Just a week after her baby was born, Margaret Larney was executed on the 2nd of October, 1758. The youngest child, who's christened William Beach, dies after a very short period of time, after only a number of days. George Millet actually goes back to Shropshire, which is interestingly the same place that he went to be wet nursed and as apprentice to a, a wig maker's. After entering the Foundling Hospital and being baptised with their new names, life followed a set routine. First, children were sent to the countryside to be wet nursed or breastfed, staying with this early kind of foster family for typically the first five years of their life. Of course, in those days, there wasn't any formula, so the babies needed milk, and so they were wet-nursed. And actually, what we know now is that if you were wet-nursed 
by a mother or a family that cared about you, what you got was the availability, the dependability and the benevolence, which then helped you form your identity as a young, a young child. All the children were sent to be nursed outside of London for the first five years of their life. And it was a way for the women to supplement their family's income, but also meant that the children being cared for within a family environment and outside of the pollution and the dirt and the disease of London at the time. We know today that this early stability and family environment would have been vital for the child's development. This bond, however, wasn't meant to last. From around the age of five, children were returned to live in the foundling hospital full-time until they were apprenticed. They probably wouldn't have known that that was what was going to happen to them. Their foster parents would probably have been very upset to see them go. Suddenly they were in this huge institution where they all had to wear the same clothes, where boys and girls were kept separate, where there was a strict discipline, um, a very strong emphasis on doing the right thing at the right time, and not really having any contact with, with the outside world. And that continued for years and years and years. The child was first of all guaranteed the best possible chance of survival. But actually beyond that, the important thing is security. So they had the security of food, a continuity in where they lived and a very high quality environment by the standards of the day. They had education when no other illegitimate child had access to education. And they had a guaranteed route to a new future through employment. What the Foundling Hospital couldn't provide in love or a family life was made up for in the safety, security and advantages that it could. The hospital was progressive for its time, with all children given the same opportunities, regardless of their background or ability. The present practice of the hospital is for the children to rise about half past six o'clock in the winter, a little earlier in summer, to make their beds, wash themselves, leave their dormitories at seven and play till eight when they breakfast, which takes less than half an hour. They go into the schools at nine, remain till 12, play till one, then dine, which also occupies about half an hour. Go into school at two, remain till five in the summer, till dusk in winter, play till six, then to supper. After supper in the winter, the younger boys retire to bed. The elder ones retire also to their wards, but remain up till eight to be catechised by the monitors in arithmetic, grammar, etc. The younger girls in the wintertime also go to bed immediately after supper, being first washed, but the elder ones remain up till about eight and are employed in needlework. In the summer, the younger girls play till about seven or half past and are then washed and go to bed. The elder ones play when the nurses can spare them from their work. There are often times for play and that is part of the, the foundling's daily life right from the start. In fact, Hans Sloan, when he's looking at the design of the hospital, has the colonnades built so that the children can go and play outside even when it's wet. Education at the Foundling Hospital included a focus on music. Music played a tremendous role in, in, in most of our lives. My first experience was of going into the chapel and hearing this magnificent Handel pipe organ and the sound which I'd never heard in my life before. It had an immediate impact uh, on me. It was a complete diversion from the very severe lifestyle that we were leading. In the end, it proved to be a brilliant aspect of my whole life because I played in military bands um, and when I went to do my national service, I ended up joining the artillery military band. And then when I came back into Sibby Street, I joined a number of orchestras over the years and, and concert bands. This chapel is actually, to me, a place of absolute tranquility. And I remember very well queuing up on the boys' side and we would go in, the youngest children first, and marching, walking into the chapel. And once you were there, it was a place where nobody could get at you. And the wonderful colours that would float across the chapel in a summer afternoon 
with the sun shining through the stained glass windows, with the sound of the Handel pipe organ reverberating around the chapel, to me was something just completely and utterly out of this world. Music had been an integral part of the Foundling Hospital since the beginning, when composer George Friedrich Handel volunteered his support to the fledgling institution. All children sang in the hospital chapel, some learned instruments, and some even had their destinies shaped by music. Blanche was admitted to the Foundling Hospital in 1758. On her billet sheet there is a little note attached to it that says Anne Dent. So this is potentially Blanche's original name before she came into the Foundling Hospital. She was inoculated for smallpox. Only a year after she was inoculated, she is recorded as being in the infirmary again for an inflammation of the eyes. And this is likely what later led to her blindness and to Blanche becoming visually impaired. Because she was blind, she couldn't be apprenticed. So she was one of the first girls to be taught to sing uh, and to play a musical instrument. And there's another girl, uh, Mercy Draper. They seem as if they often sing together. She later goes on to learn to play the harpsichord. And she does really well in this area. Um, she ends up playing at a lot of concerts in the Foundling Hospital Chapel. Um, she also does some private concerts outside of the Foundling Hospital as well. Um, and we know that she is quite popular because of her talent. Um, we know that in 1775, it's actually brought up as an issue at the subcommittee meeting that the staff at the hospital, so the officers and the servants, are making Blanche Stepford and Mercy Draper sing for guests that they have brought to the hospital. We can tell from this little story alone that Blanche was obviously very talented. Her employment actually continues at the Foundling Hospital. So she's employed as both a professional musician and also a music teacher at the Foundling Hospital. Music could also pave the way for a life of adventure in the military. Augustus Brown is admitted into the Family Hospital in 1837. We know that his mother was Eleanor Linz. What's interesting about her petition letter is that when we get the secretary's report on her sort of situation, we also find out that his father actually had a bit of a reputation for being a bit of a womanizer and getting these women into these sorts of situations and then he just leaves. So Eleanor becomes one of his victims essentially. We do know that Augustus is in John Brownlow's boy band, so we know that he played the trombone and the clarinet, and, and we know that he was quite successful at this. He was in the first section for both, so obviously quite a talented player. In 1852, he's apprenticed to a furrier, so someone who sort of processes furs and makes them into clothes. And his master actually writes to the hospital basically saying that he's a hard worker and he tries his best, but he spoils all the furs that he makes. So he's just not suited for this line of work. So the hospital then take him back, but he decides to volunteer in the army. So he ends up joining the 38th Regiment of the Foot, the band in that regiment. When the Crimean War comes about, he is then sent to Sebastopol. Unfortunately, he dies at the siege of Sebastopol due to an illness that is actually going around at the camp. During his time in the army, he actually keeps a lot of correspondence with John Brownlow, um, who ran the band. When he dies at Sebastopol, his medal and a small fee is then sent back to the hospital itself. John Brownlow keeps possession of this medal as sort of a reminder of Augustus. And the money that's sent to the hospital goes into the hospital's benevolent fund, which is basically used to help former foundlings if they're in times of great need. The Foundling Hospital aimed to provide its pupils with a path to their future. Apprenticeships were found for all children, with a hope that each might break the cycle of poverty. To go into trade and to be apprenticed means you're going to learn from the person you're apprenticed to. So it's very variable, depends on how well you're treated. You do find uh, instances where the foundlings are very well trained and you find instances where the apprentice uh, masters 
take them on permanently. One case where a, an apprentice boy is, is given the money to set himself up in business. This boy was Samuel Inman. Samuel had this experience of going to an apprenticeship um, and apparently seems to have formed this really good relationship with the master, the person that he was employed by. Um, so this man was called Rudolf Ackerman and he owned a bookshop at 101 The Strand. Ackerman's shop sold engravings and other prints. Samuel wrote to the governors at a certain point during his apprenticeship to say that he was dissatisfied with the work that he was being given. It sounds as though Samuel really wanted to become an engraver. Samuel Inman came to the governors and complained about his boss because he thought he was going to learn the art of engraving and basically he was employed just to work in the shop. But then there seems to have been at some point a kind of transition within their relationship because come a certain point, um, Ackerman was in contact with, with the governors of the hospital and said that he was really impressed with Samuel, so much so that he decided that he would set up Samuel with his own business and he would donate a load of shop goods to that effect. Certainly Samuel Inman had a business, a stationer's, which was actually in Lamb Conduit Street, so he never really went very far from the hospital. For the girls, it's about going into service, being apprenticed into service, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. A foundling girl who found her way into domestic service and then set out on her own globe-trotting adventure was Frances Coombe. Frances Coombe is admitted in the 1800s. Her mother was a servant, as was her father. It's another typical case of he then leaves her when he finds out that she's pregnant, and so she admits Frances into the hospital. She has a fairly tumultuous time in terms of her apprenticeships. She also has a couple of bouts of severe illness where she has to then be admitted into St Bartholomew's Hospital, and unfortunately her master or mistress are not able to take her back. We have records in the foundling general register of her going to Australia and actually changing her name to Fanny Finch. It's an incredibly huge decision for someone to make. Her previous apprenticeships aren't working and she feels like this is her last chance to really make a life for herself. She's able to found her own business, I think it's her own pub, essentially. Frances is essentially one of the first women in Australia to be able to vote and we believe that is because she was a business owner herself and so she had the right to vote. She's eventually able to really find her place in the world even though she's been through so much. She's still managed to get her own happy ending through her own hard work. A contemporary account of life as a foundling comes from Hannah Brown who was baptised Hannah Sherman at the Foundling Hospital in 1866. Hannah later wrote The Child She Bare, an account of her childhood experiences, which she published anonymously as A Foundling. Hannah Brown writes about how one of the teachers took a shine to her, and so she would help out in the school, and which she really liked because she didn't have to go out on cold days. In 1882, Hannah was apprenticed in household work, a common placement for female foundlings. The work is drudgery, cleaning, cooking, it might be sewing and doing stuff around the house. You do as you're told and you know your place in the servant hierarchy and you're not likely to do very well uh, and become independent from that, unless you marry. Hannah did marry and her life took a more glamorous turn than her apprenticeships may have prepared her for. In 1906, she married artist Frank Percival Brown. Hannah, herself an accomplished artist, produced illustrations for two of Frank's books, and he dedicated his 1912 book to her. In 1930, at the age of 63, Hannah had a watercolour accepted into an exhibition at the prestigious Royal Academy of Arts. At a time when children were expendable, the Foundling Hospital didn't take that. They saved the children and they gave them the opportunity to not just survive but to grow up and thrive as individuals. That was massive. It's really difficult for us to get our heads around that. And even afterwards, when you were apprenticed, they would look out for how well you were treated. Even in later life, you could apply to the Foundling Hospital for help at a time when there wasn't that kind of opportunity under the poor laws.
Ongel writes to say that she has been abandoned by the couple to whom she was apprenticed and she is many miles out of London. They've stolen all her clothes. She has absolutely nothing. And the governors send her money and re-apprentice her. We can tell the stories of individual foundlings thanks to the careful record keeping by the hospital's governors and the writings and mementos collected by former foundling John Brownlow, who stayed close to the foundling hospital his whole life, becoming secretary of the institution that raised him. John Brownlow um, started as a foundling, uh, came in in 1800. He was taken on as an apprentice in the secretary's office, so he became a clerk. He must have been very good because when his master died of cholera, they had to vote for a new secretary and John Brownlow got the top votes. What did he do while he was here? Well, he writes several pamphlets, books on infanticide, a terrible issue at the time, mothers killing their babies because of the shame of being found out. He writes about the education of the children, he sets up the boys' band, he tries to raise the profile of the founding hospital by putting on an exhibition and he really brings another dimension to founding hospital life. His daughter has done several paintings which include her father. Charles Dickens lived near the hospital when he was writing Oliver Twist. The novel includes a character named Mr Brownlow who adopts Oliver at the end. My guess is Dickens did base Mr Brownlow on John Brownlow. What you get from John Brownlow's writings is a man who really cares about children, and that's the character in Oliver Twist. Coram is the eternal champion for children, now and forever. In order to fulfill that mission, we need to treasure the past, and we need to change the future. With the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund, Coram is digitising 25% of its records. More than 5,000 volunteers in the Voices Through Time, the Story of Care programme, are transcribing 100,000 archival records. These people are not typically the ones who left behind records about their lives. And so we've got this vast archive of documents that helps us to just start to begin to understand what some of their experiences were like. This film and creative projects inspired by these records with care-experienced young people ensure they are able to tell their own stories and improve the future of care. History is almost, it depends on who tells it, whose version of it is it. And I think what I would hope by digitalising those records, it would inspire whoever from today to also capture and reflect their experience. And I think both as a trustee and in my day job, the most important thing is to actually listen, find out how all the things we think we're doing, however systems, whatever data we have or may not, how does that actually feel? What's the impact and outcome? How far have we come? How far have we not come? I think in terms of the things the Founding Hospital got right, I think there's a lot of lessons for us to learn now. I think one of the areas was around the apprenticeships and employment for young people when they, when they leave care or left the Founding Hospital. I think that's a particular issue now for um, children and young people currently when they leave care in terms of getting a job and having that kind of security and certainty. I think the founding hospital for young people played a really important part in having a kind of base or somewhere that they felt attached to in terms of coming home. And I know from some of our young people that we work with, they don't have that feeling of connectedness. There is no doubt at all that children are still the most vulnerable citizens, that they are still experiencing adult violence, hunger, disease, and what we would call today the postcode lottery, the gaps between professional interests and adult concerns into which the children fall. It is they who are left holding the risks. Coram continues to champion the rights and welfare of children just as it always has, 
learning from the past and making change happen for the future. What we forget in, in our haste to sort our problems out as adults is we forget the children, which is why I admire the work of Corin so much. He saw a way in which he could affect good literally right on his doorstep. Every child should have an equal chance in life. But in order to achieve it, Coram will continue to change the lives of children one at a time, just as Thomas Coram did. And just as he did then, we will change the entire system around children. We are already the birthplace of children's social care. We shall be its army and also its innovator for the future because we have to create and never give up on making a society that cares. The statue of Thomas Corbyn. At the end of the day, he did help thousands of families who without him could have ended up in far worse situations. I feel like he did make a really big change, especially for us, and it benefited us. Home. What is a home? A safe place. A place of belonging. A place where you feel loved. A place where you feel special. Somewhere that makes you feel appreciated. Home is not necessarily a house. It can be anywhere. The phrase, home is where the heart is. Whatever makes me happy is my home. Passion, happiness, joy, home. What makes a home? What is the key to your home?